Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with LearnVisualStudio.net. In this lesson, we're going to finally talk about the document object model, or rather, as it's known, the DOM. At a high level, the DOM is simply a hierarchical collection of software objects, each object representing a single HTML element or a single literal string on the web page. Now, one of the main reasons that the DOM exists is so that developers can programmatically modify the behavior of the web page using JavaScript. So let's suppose that you request an HTML web page from a website. The server returns the HTML page and your browser downloads the raw HTML into memory. But how does it take that raw HTML and then render it to screen and allow you to modify the behavior of the HTML using JavaScript? So I want to describe a series of steps, but in doing so, I realize that I'm oversimplifying what really goes on because honestly, I'm not privy to how these features are really implemented inside of web browsers. Uh, I'm going to be describing each step as kind of a linear process, but I am sure that modern web browsers will perform these steps in parallel and that it's a lot more complicated than I'm making it out to sound, okay? Uh, but my bare bones explanation here should serve as the general series of steps required for a web browser to translate HTML into what you ultimately view on screen and what you ultimately are working with as a JavaScript developer in the DOM. Okay, So the first step after the browser receives the raw HTML is to parse through it. The parser engine is that part of the browser that translates the HTML into a series of recognizable tokens. So, uh, for example, it'll see some text and it'll say, ooh, that's an HTML element. It'll see some more text and it'll say, ooh, that looks like a literal string. It'll see some more text, oh, that's an HTML element. And it refers to this image, this video, this flash movie, this external JavaScript file, this external cascading style sheet file. And so it may have to stop right there and start downloading some things, right? Uh, perhaps because uh, a number of different reasons. Uh, for example, with the cascading style sheets, it needs some of that information as it's constructing its DOM so that it can present things uh, correctly uh, when it gets to the part when it's actually rendering it to screen. So the parser's main job is to turn those recognizable tokens into a tree of related objects. The rendering engine will then use that tree of related objects to determine where it will position elements on screen. So you as a developer will then be able to use JavaScript to interact with this tree of related objects through a number of properties and methods that each object inherits at the point it was instantiated. All right. So most of this lesson will focus on exactly that, learning about the properties and the methods exposed by the DOM that you can reference inside of your JavaScript. So let me illustrate that with a little web page that you see on screen. Uh, so here we have a simple document with a header and a couple of paragraphs. I just want to call your attention to the uh, header one that has uh, some text in it and then also to the paragraph that has an ID of second. It also contains a child element of strong and then uh, within it it has some literal text second paragraph. So first of all in this example when the parser loads a a the, the HTML file and it locates that first h1 element it'll create an object that represents that h1 element in its own memory. The browser then attaches that new h1 element as a child to its parent object which in this case is the body element itself. And then it keeps doing this until the browser has a complete representation of the page in memory in a tree-like structure. And that tree-like structure of related objects in the browser's memory is the document object model, the DOM. So again, I'm going to oversimplify this greatly and I'm going to leave some things out, but it's roughly turned into a hierarchy of objects that look something like this, where you have some top level objects, the window of the document, and then you see the H1 in a series of paragraphs below it. Notice that paragraph with an ID of second. It has a child called strong and it has a child a uh, literal text with the words hello world inside of it and I've left the rest of those sorts of things out of this diagram. But you'll notice first of all that the DOM have has these top level objects like the window and the document. Uh, these are important. They expose a number of functions to access any given element in the DOM. So you can do things like get a reference to a given DOM element. We'll do that in just a minute. Uh, the window is important because it allows you to respond to an important event in the web pages lifecycle and we'll talk about that in just a minute too. Okay, so at this point I have another example to take a look at. It's actually similar to the one we saw on screen, but it, it actually is working. Um, 
you can see here is what it looks like in Internet Explorer. And then if we take a look at the c9js underscore 13 dot html file in notepad, you can see that inside of its body there's an h1 with the ID of title. Then it has a couple of divs. Here's a div and here's a div. And inside those divs it has three paragraphs. Notice that second paragraph still has a strong and some text in it. We'll probably get to that in a little bit. And then it also has an input type equals submit ID of click me. Remember that word click me. We'll be using that uh, throughout uh, the remainder of this video. And then it also has this hyperlink and we'll use this and it has an ID of my anchor. So we'll get to that a little bit later as well as we start programmatically touching some of these some of these HTML elements. All right. Uh, so suppose that first of all we want to attach an event handler to the click event of this this button, the submit button with an ID of click me. How would we go about doing that? Well, let's take a look at the script13.js. You should be able to locate it with the rest of the, the uh, content that you uh, were able to download for this video. And notice that it has, uh, we have a function in it already called function run the example. And it's simply going to open up an alert box. We'll add some more code in this as time goes on. But the first thing I want to do is try to attach this function and have it fire off every time the input button is clicked. So how can we go about doing that? Well, what we can try the first time around is to get a reference programmatically to that input button. And then we'll attach this event to its onClick uh, event property. So let's start here. Click me button. So I've got a variable called click me button. And I'm going to use the document dot get element by ID. So it's that document object. Again, this gives us access programmatic access to the rest of the DOM. And we'll use this get element by ID method to retrieve a single element in the DOM using its ID in this case, click me. All right. Now that we have a reference to that that input button, then I'm going to use click me button dot on click. So whenever the button is clicked, we're going to execute run the example, which is this code right here. All right. So let's try this. Go ahead and refresh my browser. But as you can see, absolutely nothing happens. And the reason nothing happens is because there's a timing issue, or rather, there's an issue with the order in which the events are occurring on the web page. I'm going to have a lot more to say about this at the very end of this video, but in a nutshell, at the point when this code is executed, the DOM element called ClickMe has not yet been created. So the code is ignored, and since this code is ignored, Obviously, this code is ignored, and we never get it to execute whenever you click the Click Me button on the web page. All right, so what we need to do is slow this down a little bit, wait for the Click Me button to be created as a DOM element, then we can execute this code. And then, because we executed that code and we attached the Run the Example to the On Click event, whenever we click the button, it'll actually happen. And so uh, one option that we have is to use a event called window.onload. And the window.onload event is raised once the entire web page has been loaded, not just once the DOM has been finished, uh, has finished being constructed, but also once all images and videos and flash piles and what have you that that web page is referencing, after all of that has been successfully downloaded, there's nothing else to download, then the window.onload event will fire. All right, so we're going to see a little bit that why this is a problem. Uh, but at first glance, it's great because we can be 100% sure that the DOM will be available at that point. Um, the downside is that it could take our web page a really, really, really long time to download huge image files, huge video files, huge flash, or whatever the case might be, files that are associated with that web page. And so we're going to be waiting a long time for that window.onload event to fire off. Meanwhile, the user could be clicking around our web page 
but we haven't had a chance to attach our JavaScript to that web page yet. You see the dilemma? Again, let's table this, come back to it a little bit later in this video. For now, we don't have any images. I'm not really all that worried about it. This will work for the time being, all right? And what will work? Well, here's what I'm gonna do. So we'll go window dot onload equals, and then I'll create an anonymous function. And that anonymous function will just contain these two lines of code in it. All right, so let's save this. Let's refresh that. And now when we click the click me button, we get running the example alert box to show up because our button was successfully attached to this to this function. All right. Now, I took two steps just to demonstrate what the doc, uh, document get by element by ID does. Most of the time when you see this, it's going to look more like this. And then immediately you'll call the on click and set that equal to run the example. All right. So that's a little bit more realistic. Let me refresh this and it still works. Great. Okay. So just to be clear here, I'm attaching an anonymous function to the onload event of the window. So once the web page completely finishes, this function will fire off, which in turn, We'll find the click me button and attach the run the example to that, the click event of that button. Great. Uh, so basically, once you have a programmatic reference to read values from elements in the DOM, uh, to change values of elements in the DOM, uh, to add new elements to the DOM, to attach JavaScript code like we did to elements that are fired by interacting with elements in the DOM, like clicking a button or a link or so on. But it all starts with getting a reference to an individual element in the DOM or one or more elements in the DOM. And once you have an, a reference, you can change its content, you can change its style, its visibility, change its behavior, manipulate it in a number of different ways. So now that we understand how to get a reference to a given element in the DOM, let's look at some of the ways, just a few of the ways that we can now navigate through the DOM, change properties of a given DOM element, and so on. So at this point, what I wanna do is, I'm gonna actually save this for later because we're gonna come back to this simple version. And what I'm gonna do is create a new version of it that we'll use for the time being, okay? And uh, what we'll start with is, let's just get a reference to one of the elements inside of our HTML page. So var my element equals document.get element by ID and let's grab that second paragraph the element with the, the paragraph element with the ID of second remember that one we kind of picked on it a couple of times here and uh, the first thing we can do is just find out what kind of a HTML element it is so var my node name equals my element dot node uh, name and then let's just do alert my node name and I'm taking some extra steps here I could have compacted this greatly uh, but I want to make everything clear as to what we're doing and why we're doing it so at this point we can see that second paragraph is of type P uh, it's a paragraph element in other words okay great now let's do this uh, let's make sure that uh, my element is not null it's not empty and if it's not empty, then let's do an, a different alert. This time, let's go my element and grab its inner HTML. And I have a caution about this in just a moment here. Let's comment this one out. And let's refresh this. And so what we can do is grab the HTML that's inside of our paragraph. So that's why we're seeing HTML tags like strong surrounding the text itself, second paragraph, okay? And the good folks at Microsoft wanted me to caution you about using inner HTML. So inner HTML has years of vendor support, browser support. Uh, the fact is that until the HTML5 specification came out, uh, it was uh, never a standard. It was never uh, 
something that you can rely on all browsers supporting. So again, while almost every browser has supported inner HTML, you want, might want to use it with caution. This is another area where jQuery will smooth over the browser differences and give us properties that we can use across virtually every popular browser. So probably in the real world going forward, I would never use inner HTML. I probably rely on jQuery for some of these sorts of things to retrieve certain values like the text that's inside of a given element and so on, all right? So just use inner HTML with caution, but hey, since we're on the topic, let's go ahead and use inner HTML in another capacity. Here, I'm just gonna start over again from scratch and do inner HTML equals see how I set the text here. And so what we're gonna do, here we grabbed the value of inner HTML and sent it to screen. But now, let's comment all this out. Let's use it to set content on screen. And you're gonna need to watch closely what happens here. So let's refresh this. Now notice it says second paragraph, but I'm gonna click the button and it changes to see how I set the text here. So that's what I meant by behavior and by um, reacting to some DOM events and then using that to trigger the change of the appearance of other DOM elements, okay? Neat. But again, we never want to use inner HTML if we can, if we can uh, avoid it. And we probably prefer to use jQuery instead. All right, so what else can you do? Well, you can get all of the same elements on a given page. So here we go, a list of paragraphs. And I want to do document dot get elements by tag name. Give me all of the paragraph elements. And now that I have this array of paragraph elements, what can I do with it? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is just see how many there are. So list of paragraph paragraphs dot length. Great. So this will show me how many I have. And I have three paragraph elements, awesome. Let's comment that out. And let's see, how do we get at just one of the paragraph elements? Let's do this, var second paragraph. So I'm gonna yank off one of the paragraph elements and put it in its own variable and then I can work with it individually, all right? Uh, paragraphs and the way I'm going to do that since I'm working with an array is I'm just going to work with the second paragraph this is zero base since it's an array so I'm going to use the index of one to get to that second uh, that second element in the array and then I'll do alert second paragraph and I just can't help myself I'm going to grab the inner HTML again I know kind of a rebel that way aren't I and there we go. We're back to the inner HTML of our second paragraph. Cool. All right, so we're able to get elements by ID. We're able to get elements by tag name. Can we get elements by class? Yes, sort of. There is a new uh, method called get elements by class name as defined in the HTML5 specification. However, it's not supported in all older web browsers. And so you have a couple of choices. You could go off and create your own uh, version of this that just basically looks through every element in the DOM and looks for, uh, looks at its class and add it to an array. You can do that on your own or just use jQuery because that's what it does by default. jQuery use CSS selectors to return an array or a collection, I guess, of individual DOM elements that all have the same class name. That's what it's best at. So. Uh, I would probably just say, eh, don't do this, use jQuery instead. And I'll say that quite a bit as a matter of fact. Um, but at any rate, uh, let's grab, well, actually let's just comment all this out. And let's start over one more time. My element equals document.get element by ID. And we'll pick on that second element again. Now. Here's where we can start navigating through the document object model. Like, how do I find out what the parent of this of this element is? 
we can get to it through the parent node property and then we can just keep using the dot notation to get to a property of an object which is a property of another object so node name and save that and if we look here what we expect to see what is the parent of our of our paragraph the parent is this div as we can see through the notation or the uh, the indentation levels so let's see if we get that result and we do the paragraph is a div awesome all right, and I'm not going to demonstrate all these. Um, in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and kind of make some more multi-line comments here. But uh, we can navigate through the DOM in a couple of different ways, like my element dot find all the children, so all child nodes, and this will give me an array of children that belong to this element, and I can access it through, you know, a zero-based index as well. After I find out exactly how many uh, children are associated with that given element if I needed to, all right? So let's just leave it at this for now. I can also get down to just the first child. Or I can get down to the last child, get a reference to it. Uh, I can get to uh, looking at this element what is my next sibling? So who's my parent div? What are the rest of their children? Well, in this case, there's more paragraphs, right? Um, and I can get to the previous sibling. And so that's what I'm doing with, with these methods as well, or these properties. Okay. Um, now, we've seen up to this point how we can work with inner HTML. We can actually modify just about any attribute of a given DOM element. So in this case, let's play around with the anchor tag. You'll remember the anchor tag on our web page has a href set to bing.com and has an ID of my anchor. All right. So let's play with that a little bit. Anchor dot, well, I'm sorry, var anchor equals document dot get element by ID my anchor and now let's uh, find out the destination of that anchor tag by checking its href property and then let's go ahead and just alert that anchor destination refresh and we can see that we were able to retrieve the attribute of the href. Now let's go a step further with this. Comment these out. And let's actually set uh, the anchor. Now let's try just doing, uh, starting with something simple like href equals uh, http colon slash www.learnvisualstudio.net, my website save that and then let's refresh this and so you can see I'm gonna hover my mouse cursor over the anchor tag and you notice in the lower left hand corner it says the current href is bing.com I'm gonna click me and now I hover my mouse cursor over it, and it changed uh, the href to uh, learnvisualstudio.net awesome now honestly in some older web browsers it will not allow you to access either get or set a given property using the simplified syntax and some older browsers you have to do something like this anchor dot set attribute href and then uh, http colon slash slash learn visual studio dot net or I'd have to do anchor dot get attribute uh, href to do something like I did earlier um, However, in newer versions of the browser, you don't have to worry about that. And again, if you're using jQuery, you probably don't even need to, uh, to worry about any of this because they have their own uh, means of setting and retrieving attributes, okay? Uh, so at any rate, I think that pretty much ends uh, the examples that I wanted to, uh, to talk about for now, at least in this particular example. I'm gonna comment this whole thing out because I have a bigger topic I wanna talk about. 
And so now we do not have a live run the example. They're both commented out, all right? But um, we've talked about get element by ID, and we've seen a couple of other ways, like get elements by tag name and get elements by class name, uh, and other ways to navigate through the DOM using a going parent node, child nodes, first child, last child, next sibling, and so on. Uh, and I just want to make it clear, once you start using jQuery, you probably never do it this way again, because jQuery provides a shorthand experience and a more powerful set of selectors for uh, based on cascading style sheets. It makes it easier to navigate through your DOM. Uh, more about that in the next lesson. Don't want to bog down too much here. One other quick note, you can change styles in JavaScript so I can add individual styles, like change the, the font or the text color, the background, foreground, things of that nature, directly from JavaScript. I didn't demonstrate that because I don't believe you should do that. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Um, what I think the more proper way to do it is define a CSS style, and then, again, using jQuery, you can attach and detach styles from DOM elements and I think we're gonna demonstrate that later in this series as well. So I just wanted to address that uh, since you might be thinking, ooh, I could style something in, you know, put a, a yellow color behind it as somebody clicks something. Um, don't do that. Don't just change one attribute like the background color. Change the class, all right? All right, so moving on, and before I wrap up, I want to um, talk about that wrinkle that we discovered earlier in this video when we needed to add some JavaScript after the DOM has been constructed. Our first real opportunity to do that was in our window.onload up here. And recall that window.onload fires off after all the images, video, flash animations, and so on have been loaded, all right? That's the problem because if it takes our web page a long time to download all those large images and video files and so on, then the user may see parts of the web page, maybe see all of the web page, waiting for images to slowly make their way into the browser and even be able to interact with the web page, but we haven't had a chance to wire up our JavaScript yet. And so our JavaScript is late to the party, so to speak. Somebody's already clicking around and doing stuff, and we haven't had a chance to really give the user the full experience because we wired it up too late in the process. Um, so just to be clear, I want to oversimplify a, a, and create a diagram here of the problem. In reality, some of these things are happening in parallel, but don't miss the real point. The process begins with parsing the HTML into DOM. At some point, it's going to begin loading external resources like images. At some point, the page is partially rendered to screen. As the parsing of the HTML into DOM happens, JavaScript could be executing if we have any JavaScript in the page uh, that references DOM elements. Uh, but it's not until much, much later in the process, until everything is finished, when the window.onload event is firing. And so it's this gap right here in the middle that, that that's worrisome because again, uh, the user could be interacting with our web page, but we haven't had an opportunity yet to wire up the window.onload event, to, uh, to wire up the other um, controls like we've done here, like the command on click, uh, the button on click event and so on. Um, and so that's, that's really where the issue is at. So as you might expect, Newer web browsers support new standards. They have better support for this whole situation. There are new events available in newer browsers that allow you to tap into the moment when the DOM is ready. However, in older browsers, it seems like every browser vendor had a slightly different solution, so there's no unified way to really handle this. Now, there is an easy remedy for this situation, but I don't think we're going to like it very much based on the, what we learned in the previous lesson. As we saw earlier, we could mix our JavaScript code in with our HTML so that we can load bits of JavaScript right as it is encountered inside of the HTML page as, through the DOM parsing process. So you'll recall from very early on, we can execute JavaScript inside of the body of our HTML page. The code executes as it's being encountered. Um, 
and it will execute so long as it's not interacting with a DOM object that has been already created and added to the tree. Uh, as long as that's happened, then it's it's available for manipulation. All right, so let me just illustrate this because I may have butchered that explanation a tiny bit. So what we're going to do is uncomment out our run the example. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is comment out this. And uh, I also think this isn't going to work. I'm going to get rid of all these. Otherwise, I'm going to be shooting myself in the foot here. And uh, that should stay. All right. So, okay, great. So let's go ahead and save that. And then I want to keep this part um, because I'm going to use that here in my C9 JS underscore 13.html file. We're going to start here with creating a new script. Uh, type equals text JavaScript. And we'll start by just putting that there. Let's save it. Now, do you think this will work? Well, no, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because this uh, JavaScript code gets executed way before a, the instance of the click me input type equals submit is added to the DOM. All right, so let's just cut to the chase here and move this directly after we would expect it to be created in the DOM. So let's go ahead and save this. And now let's, uh, let's refresh this. And it works. All right, just to be sure there's nothing on my sleeve, let me cut this and put it right before that line of code. Right before the click me button is created in the DOM. And nothing happens. All right, so, um, yeah, so I could get this example to work and to not have to worry about this whole time gap issue like we saw on the slide a moment ago. But do you see the trade-off that I had to make? Uh, I had to mix JavaScript and HTML in the same document, and we spent a long time in the previous video explaining why we wanted to avoid that. So fortunately, this is one of those problems that Java, jQuery will just solve for us, and we can learn that in the next video. But, uh, you know, the reason why this kind of worked when we were using Window on Load was... Our example web page was small. We had no external references to images. So I suspected uh, I was pretty safe that the gap between the time when the DOM was finished and when the rendering of the page was finished and the window on load fired was minuscule. So in the real world scenario, however, this is something we want to be aware of because it has the potential to break our applications for certain users, especially those with dial-up access to the internet. Okay, so let's go ahead and recap and then finish this up. First of all, we talked about the document object model at length. Uh, we said it's the browser's internal mapping of elements on the web page to objects in the computer's memory available for the express purpose of allowing JavaScript code to read and manipulate those elements. And we saw that uh, you can use many built-in DOM functions to access one or more elements on the web page. You can also navigate through the relationships of the elements like parent, child, sibling, and so on. Uh, we looked at how to set properties and get retrieve values from the properties of each of the DOM elements. Um, several times during this lesson, I said, hey, that's, that's nice, but uh, you'll never really want to do it that way because it's easier to do it in jQuery. So for example, selecting an element of the DOM is easier in jQuery than using the built-in DOM API, at least in my opinion. Uh, the same is true with events. The same is true with styling your events at runtime. The same is true with how we'll solve this dilemma that we were just finished talking about. Uh, where we want to write code as soon as the DOM is constructed, but we don't want to wait for all the images and everything else to load on the page. Uh, waiting for the window.onload event could result in our JavaScript arriving late to the party, as I said. Uh, so, at any rate, uh, we learned quite a bit. We've gotten to the point where we're beginning to transition from JavaScript into jQuery, uh, which again smooths over a lot of the rough spots that we've seen up to this point. And I'm excited to start really talking about it in earnest in the next lesson, and so we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.